In my father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Chances are the last time you heard that line, you were at the same place I was the last time I heard that line. I was standing next to a green funeral tent on a windy day. In fact, funerals and cemeteries are about the only place we talk about death or heaven. It looms for all of us. We all have questions, but we just don't discuss mortality at all, perhaps because it's such a downer to so many, such a mournful subject. So we tend to just bracket that subject for the one day when the black limousines roll and then otherwise, we don't talk about it at all. Well, I think there are a lot of problems with that approach. And one is that the only Christian theology, the only biblically informed view of death, is offered up at a time when we're the least likely to take it in. I mean, in the fog of grief, in the cloud of numbness, in the midst of all of that sorrow, it's usually not our most teachable moment. We're not eager students of the biblical truth. We just want the day to be over and the pain to stop. And the second problem is that it leaves the media voices to fill the void. TV and movies and songs then start creeping in and filling the space that's left empty by the preachers. I heard a lecture once on images of death and heaven from country music. Now, you, first you might wonder why in the world I'd go to a lecture on images of death and heaven from country music. Here's why. In my former life at the seminary, I used to go to these annual conferences every year. We were all supposed to go. And they were conferences where academics delivered academic papers to impress other academics. And it was not my bag. Uh, hundreds of lectures going on at the same time. And the only thing they had in common is that they all avoided clear speech and good communication. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love academics, I was one of them. It's just that most academics don't love clear speech. So in this room you could hear a womanist perspective on 1 Kings 2.6, and then in this room you could hear a paper on the new eschatology process, theology and liberationist thought, which meant I was walking the halls looking for some lecture I might actually follow and enjoy. And my college classmate, David Fillingem, was working on a book that he later published titled Regnet Liberation, Country Music as Theology. And I thought, finally, I found a lecture I can follow. Let's go. And on this day, he was talking about images of death and dying in heaven in country music. He had a guitar around his neck, he played a while, he lectured a while. I was mesmerized. He went through song after song that have shaped the popular images of heaven, but they are not biblical images. And I looked and I couldn't find my notes from his lecture, so I had to go online and do my own search. Listen to a few of these. The first is an excerpt from Steve Warriner's Holes in the Floor of Heaven. One day shy of eight years old when Grandma passed away, I was a broken-hearted little boy blowing out that birthday cake. How I cried when the sky let go with a cold, lonesome rain. My mom smiled, said, don't be sad, child. Grandma's watching you today because there's holes in the floor of heaven and her tears are pouring down, that's exactly how you know she's watching. Not exactly a biblical image. Brad Paisley, when I get where I'm going. Yeah, when I get where I'm going, don't cry for me down here. 
I'm going to walk with my granddaddy. He'll match me step for step, and I'll tell him how I missed him every minute since he left. Then I'll hug his neck. That's sweet. Not biblical, but it's sweet. Joe D. Messina, this is my last one. I guess heaven was needing a hero. I guess heaven was needing a hero, somebody just like you, brave enough to stand up for what you believe and follow it through. When I try to make it make sense in my mind, the only conclusion I come to is that heaven was needing a hero like you. Not only not biblical, but terrible. I'll stop there. I think I've made the point. And it's not just country music filling the void. It's all kinds of music. It's TV. We hadn't talked about George Burns and Morgan Freeman playing God in the movies or the Charmin commercials with the clouds. My point is there's a lot informing us about heaven and death that's not biblical. They are cultural images, not biblical revelation. And while some of it is harmless, I'll, I'll see granddaddy and hug his neck, some of the images advance a distorted theology. Heaven was needing a hero. Suggest God is up in heaven plucking folks up that God would like to have nearby. You've probably heard some version of this at a funeral you attended. Well, God just needed one more angel. And it makes God capricious and cruel. So let's look today at two aspects of death and heaven from the biblical witness. What happens to us when we die? And what is heaven really like? In both cases, I have good news and bad news. The good news is that the Bible speaks to both of these. The bad news is when I'm finished, you may have more questions than you did when I started. What happens to the dead in Christ when we die? The Bible makes clear, goes out of its way to make clear and then underline that Jesus was raised bodily. The gospel writers are clear on this point, but what happens to us when we die? Well, the New Testament provides evidence for two different answers. Paul in Thessalonians says that the dead will lie in state, so to speak, until that last day when all the dead in Christ will be raised together at the sound of the trumpet. For the Lord himself, I'm quoting, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That great getting up morning, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. But the second image, also scriptural, and even Paul again, I'm, I'm telling this story from the Philippian letter. He couldn't make up his mind whether it was better to depart and be with Christ or stick around and do some more ministry, which implies that he would be with Christ immediately. It doesn't sound much like he's going to storage. And, and you remember Jesus told about the poor man, Lazarus, who died, was immediately carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. Immediately. And you remember Jesus saying to the man on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. So which is it? Today you will be with me in paradise, or when the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ shall rise. And I didn't even complicate it with medieval doctrines of purgatory. It's unclear. But this is important, I think. The experience is the same either way. Either way you interpret, when we die, we will awake in the presence of God. And what goes to heaven? Body, essence, spirit? 
When I was in the seminary, I took a worship course from Dr. John, John Carlton, and he was trying to impress on us one day about the need for being prepared. Never wing it. Always be prepared. He wanted every minister to go to every worship service completely equipped, even scripted. He wanted nothing left to chance. And then he told stories of how unrehearsed, unprepared ministers made ugly but honest mistakes. And he told us about a funeral he went to where he said a really good-spirited preacher was trying to comfort the pastor by talking about the eternity of the soul, the body's dead, the soul's eternal. He kept pointing to the casket, trying to make his illustration. It was an illustration he hadn't practiced, but he was just trying to comfort. And he finally said, what's there is just a shell. It's, it's, it's just a shell. The shell is still here, but the nut has gone on to heaven. <laughs> no. But the theology is unclear. Are we disembodied platonic persons? Body and spirit separate? Shell and nut separate? It's what the Westminster Confession of Faith says. The bodies of men after death return to dust and see corruption, but their souls, which neither die nor sleep, having an immortal substance, immediately return to God who gave them. Or, or is there a bodily resurrection? As Paul said, this perishable body must put on imperishability. So do we go to heaven immediately or later? Is it only spirit that goes or more of us that goes? Well, now that I've cleared that up, let me move to our second question. What is heaven like? And wouldn't you know it, there are two possibilities here too. The first is to take all of the biblical images literally at face value and finally, we get to today's scripture. Jesus says to the disciples, In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. The King James Version uses language we're probably more familiar with. In my father's house, there are many mansions. And then we're informed by the book of Revelation, which gives us images of white robes and a throne and a place where there will be no more night. In Revelation's New Jerusalem, where we draw these images of heaven, the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great streets of the city was of gold as pure as transparent glass. And so some who favor a more literal reading will say, heaven is a place where I go, I walk through a pearly gate, I will get the key to my mansion built in glory, I will walk streets of gold, real streets of real gold. I will put my key into the mansion I was given. All of that precisely and literally true. And other interpreters, no less faithful, have seen this as something other than literal. For them, the images are just the best possible version of an experience that anybody could possibly imagine. So they just played it out in their mind. What would the best possible place be like? Well, this is before electricity. So somebody would have said, it'll be a place where it's never dark, never night. Yeah, yeah. 
in a day of dirt and dust where they walked in the filth all the time and nothing was paved, somebody might have said, I bet it's a place where the robes are white and they stay white all the time. They never even get dirty. Yeah, yeah, and I bet the streets will be paved with gold. I'll never wipe dirt off my feet again. I bet they even use pearls as building materials. Yeah, that's right. So some think that these images are a reminder that in the presence of God, it will be the most marvelous place I can imagine, and that these images of heaven are just the most mag magical things that people could think of at the time. What is a biblical theology of heaven and death? You have some room to work. Today you will be with me in paradise or that great getting up morning. We can make the case for either. Literal mansions and pearls or the imaginative language of the best it could possibly be. You can make the case for either. But still, our answer must be biblical. It must be grounded in the text and not shaped by a Pixar movie. We've got to be informed by our scripture. We've got to talk to each other using the images of heaven and death that come from the holy text and not from pa toilet paper commercials. These are our images. This is our stewardship. So my answer, and this does not need to be yours, it, I think I've made the case that there's no sure definitive way to think about this, but here's my answer. And my answer is grounded in a part of today's scripture that has not been given much attention yet. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, and where I am, there you may be also. Heaven is the place where Jesus is and where Jesus reigns, and it will be perfect. And when the little girl asked me at the funeral home, will I recognize my grandma in heaven, I say yes. I say yes every time, unqualified. But when I have the same conversation with adults, I nuance it a little more. And I say this. Jesus has prepared a place for us and is coming to take us to be with him so that where he is, there we may be also, which means that nothing is lacking. The full, unencumbered presence of Christ is a place where nothing is scarce, where joy is complete, and whatever the specifics, recognizing relatives being united with your favorite goldfish, whatever is needed for your joy to be complete, heaven will be abundant, eternity will be full of wholeness and gladness, because we are in the full light of Christ's presence. That's the promise and the victory, which is why we don't need to be bashful about talking about death. I know it can be a downer and it can be mournful. It is full of loss and grief. But for the Christian, it is also the fulfillment of promise it's the day our faith becomes sight. It is the power of the resurrection over all things that destroy. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Thanks be to God. Stand and sing and respond as you feel led.